This Black History Month, join us in celebrating Black resistance, past, present, and future. Pick up a copy of our Black History Month journal. Get inspired by our posters of Black icons at library locations across the borough. And browse our book lists, all ages programs, and much more at queenslib.org forward slash BHM 2023. What's your favorite thing to do at the library? Get creative and show us by submitting a photo to our sixth annual Share Your Love for Queens Public Library contest from February 1st through February 28th. Learn more at queenslib.org forward slash library lovers 2023. Tax season is here. Queens Public Library is partnering with a number of organizations to offer free in-person tax counseling sessions at several QPL locations. Visit our blog at queenslibrary.org for more information. Welcome to Wellness Wednesdays. I'm Christopher Galarza, Queens Public Library's Community Health Educator. Today, we welcome back Cherise Francis for our monthly workshop series, where we will read and discuss excerpts from essays and generate written work based on prompts inspired by the memoir anthology, You Are Your Best Thing, Vulnerability, Shame Resilience, and the Black Experience, edited by Tarana Burke and Brene Brown. Based on the quotation from Toni Morrison's Beloved, how can we see ourselves as our own best thing? How does living in our truth give us the breathing room to be our full selves? We will be deep diving into various themes like vulnerability, family, healing, spirituality, social and institutional oppressions, art, and memory. Charisse, we're so glad to have you here in the new year and in Black History Month, and please take it away. Thank you, Christopher, and welcome back, everyone. Um, today, we will be discussing naming and memory. And we'll be reading um, from Lovey Ajayi Jones, What's in a Name. So this image is uh, depicting a Yoruba naming ceremony called Isomo Loruko. And naming ceremonies are, import, are an important part of cultures throughout um, the world. And Lovey, um, whose work we'll be reading today, is from the Yoruba culture. So I thought it would be great to learn a little bit about Yoruba culture. And so in reference to naming, how naming is an important part of wellness, because naming is a part of, names are an impo important part of our identities, of how we see ourselves, um, of our connections to our cultures, uh, connections to our past, and also connections to how we see ourselves in the future. So speaking of names, a few years ago, I did a series of poems that were looking into the meanings and roots of my three names, Sharice Veronica Francis. And um, I found out a lot of interesting meanings of what my name um, was. And this is the poem that was based off of my first name, Sharice. And I'll just read it real quickly here. So naming ceremony, study of first name. Did Dawn name me? Did my grandmother? Did cherry trees bow to my image? Did I see my mother's thirst? Was her thirst also mine? Was my name red as blood? 
Was my name to be like hanging fruit? Was my name to be rays of stems from a pink blossom? Was Washington's reward for truth telling I di a diversion from bearing the truths of my axed skin? Must I learn history, biography, and myth intertwine the founding of a nation and the founding of God as blurred between fiction and fact? Must I learn to gain knowledge through made up tales? Must I learn the foundations of morality or lies? Is it a paradox to invent a story about the inability to lie? Was I meant to be a P.T. Barnum sideshow attraction and raise lies into reality like a magic trick? Why did I wait so long to rediscover the small block of wood carved with the character for cherry blossom and its vessel of red ink? Is the closest translation of my name in Japanese Sakura? When I told them my name means cherries, did I think about its other possible meanings? Did I know the cherry blossom symbolized the beautiful brevity, the preciousness of life? Is that why I have come to this wisdom at this moment to cherish everything because they won't last? Like the way I found I would when I found those blossoms again blanketing the garden of Louis Latimer's house. Is my name the same as the principal Mono Noare? Did Eve know that all paradise is transient and not a parking lot? Should I accept my hometown with a pink hotel, a boutique, and a swinging hot spot, trees in a museum? Did you know the origin of my name is Caris, goddess of grace, the root of charity and charisma? Is my blessing to be a blessing, to marry deformity, to marry lack, and see it as a foundation of creativity and beauty, the way Caris did with Hesphestus? How did my aunt Cindy know the meaning of my name when this was our first meeting? How did my cousin have the meaning of my name as her name? Is my name on the highest branch and I am a slow-eyed thorn sufferer for its reach? Is my name mine or part of some larger scheme? So that poem was in the form of a series of questions because I believe names can connect to various uh, meanings and potentials of who we can be. And in doing my re the research on my first name, I found various connections to Greek mythology, to um, the history of George Washington and um, chopping down the cherry tree, um, and um, the importance of cherry blossoms in Japanese culture. So all these various connections were possible just for me looking at the possible meanings of my name. So in thinking about that and reflecting on my own poem, I would like to present the first prompt. Um, what is the story behind your name? Who gave you your name? Why? What are the meanings and etymologies of your name? What is the meaning of your name in other languages? What are some folk tales, stories, myths associated with your name? What else would you like to know about your name? And here I included Lakisha, and Lakisha originates from a Swahili name meaning favorite. And um, the popularity of Lakisha originated in the French influence on Black people in America. And I thought it was important to mention that because oftentimes with uh, Black names, and we'll discuss that uh, later on in the workshop, um, there's often discrimination and um, Black people have their names made fun of when um, those names originate in other languages like Swahili, um, Islamic names. So, so you'll hear like the La and La is often in relation to Al in Arabic. And so it shows the history of um, uh enslaved Black people who may have been Muslim being brought over to the Americas. So there's a lot of history behind our naming as well. And oftentimes a lot of people don't know that. And so it's easy to just make fun of our names instead of understanding that. So in thinking about your name, I'm going to give you a few minutes to write about your own name.
Okay, so I hope you were able to research a little bit about your name and write some things down. And now I would like to start reading from Lavia Jai Jones' um, What's in a Name essay. My name is Lavi, last name Ajay Jones. The Jones part is new. I got married in September 2019. I had many important decisions to make, like how many people's feelings I was going to hurt by not inviting them. Weddings are expensive, and I love more people than I can afford to love. Another significant decision I made was to take on the last name of the man I married. I took on the new but kept the old also because whoever said you can't have your cake and eat it too never sat in front of good cake. To drop the Ajayi part of who I am felt like I'd be leaving behind who I've been, which is strange because this is officially the fourth name I've gone by. You think I'd be used to changing my name by now. I low-key understand Sean, John, Puffy, P. Diddy, Diddy, Love, Combs, low-key, because sometimes you are compelled to go by something new as your life journey moves forward. Let me explain. First, I was Ifeolo Lua Ajayi, then Lavette Ajayi, then Lovey Ajayi, now Lovey Ajayi Jones, the immigrant, the scared new girl, the growing adult, the married woman. I've made name switches in moments when I'm about to make leaps, often in fear and often quickly as if my spirit knows it's time. And each instance has led to me meeting who I was meant to be. My given first name is Ifeolua and it means God's love. Ife, Ife love, Olua God in Yoruba. Shorten, it's Ife. For the first nine years of my life, that's what I went by. I am a child of Yoruba land, and in our culture, the names we are given lay the groundwork for a child who's entering the world. They are dreams of, for our future and are used to speak power into us and light our paths. My parents wanted my life to be anointed and led by love. So shall it be. I was born and raised in Nigeria, and my name moved to the United States when I was nine years old. And my family moved to the United States when I was nine years old. On my first day of school in Chicago, a city I had visited only once before, I felt strangeness for the first time. It was new for me to walk into a room where I was expected to belong, yet not everyone looked like me. It was my first time being new. And it was the first time I felt like, like who I was just wouldn't do. Coming from Nigeria, where everyone looked like me, spoke like me, and was Black like me, nine-year-old Ife was shook. Her usual solid feet wobbled a bit, and her self-assuredness hid behind her in fear. When I walked into the classroom, the teacher put me on the spot and asked me to stand in front of all these strange faces to introduce myself. I immediately felt my tongue too heavy and knew I was too different. My name? I knew it wasn't welcome there. I just knew because no one prepped me for this major change in my life and location. Ife Olua, Ife Olua, or it would, it, oh, it would be a tongue twister. The tone was also specific and it was too peculiar. It was too foreign and it wouldn't do. So I introduced myself shakily as Lovette instead. It was a nickname that one of my aunts would call me from time to time. My given name felt like it was too much. What I felt what I felt wasn't shame because I truly I was truly proud of my name. I loved it. I felt the need to protect a sacred part of me. So I decided in 3 seconds after I was asked that I wouldn't let people in school have access to that version of me. That is how Ifolua Ajayi became Love It Ajayi. Having teachers looked at my first name on their roll call list, then frown or say, whew, okay, this one is hard, affirmed my decision. And then having them butcher Ajayi confirmed the message of this thing about you makes us uncomfortable. I began to show up early on the first days of every year so I could go to each class and teacher and correct them before everyone else showed up. I told them to cross out Ifeolua on the list and replace it with Lovette. 
I didn't even want to deal with the public butchering and shame projection sent my way. I settled into being loved at quickly as kids are adaptable. I chose her and she was a necessary protector of my realm. At home, I was still F.A., eating her jollof rice and pounded yam with a goosey stew. At school, sometimes I'd take sandwiches when I got tired of the kids asking, what's that of my Nigerian food? By high school, I lost most of my Nigerian accent and didn't stand out much anymore because of how I spoke. At graduation, we were required to be called by our legal names. Our school vice principal came to me a week before the ceremony and asked me to pronounce my name for him so he could get it right as I walked across the stage. He and I practiced my name for 10 minutes. Ooh, Lord, bless it. But it was worth it. On graduation day, as I went next in line and handed over the card with Ifeolua Ajayi and its phonetic spelling written on it, my white vice principal saw my name, felt burdened by it, and said something that sounded like he was chewing gum. The only reason I knew he was referring to me was because there was no one in front of me. Comme des fafons, dude, we practice. Ugh, just give me my diploma. This is why I revoked access to the use of that name. Then I got to college where the best learnings are outside the classroom. It was there I met with others with stories like mine who also went by new names to keep theirs from being butchered. It was there where people heard my last name and instead of tilting their heads in confusion, they beamed, oh, you're Nigerian, that's awesome. College is where people can be different in ways high school doesn't welcome. And to find that community was affirmation and encouragement to use my difference as a superpower. We'll stop there for now. And so as we read um, uh, from Lovey talking about how her name connects her to her culture and her identity as a Black Yoruba um, woman, but also the difficulty of being an immigrant in another, in a new place where you're seen as foreign and people don't easily understand you or may not want to take the time to easily understand you and even learn your new name because they see your name as too difficult. Um, you can see the complexities that names can have for a person socially. And um, this is an article from Iman Baobid um, on the importance of names. Our names are an incredi incredibly important part of our identity. They carry deep personal, cultural, familiar, and historical connections. They also give us a sense of who we are, the communities in which we belong, and our place in the world. This is why mispronunciations, misuse of our preferred common names, or misgendering can affect can negatively affect and possibly hurt and impact a sense of belonging. And as we read um, with Lovey, um, she changed her name to protect that aspect of her that she felt was going to be butchered because of those pr mispronunciations of her um, Yoruba name. And this is another um, article from Maria Konikova, Why Your Name Matters. And um, an important term that's mentioned in this article is name signaling. And name signaling is basically the associations and social meanings that are attached to your name. And in this article, it talked about um, various studies that are done that have been done with naming, such as the one that was done in 1948. And um, in that study, it was uh, about uh, men who had unusual or more like foreign names or names that weren't considered American names. Um, so they were more, more, more likely to have flunked out or to have exhibited symptoms of psychological neurosis, according to that study. The mics were doing just fine, but the Baryans were having trouble. And according to that study, a rare name had a negative psychological effect on its bear. 
And um, later on, there have been studies to kind of um, update the thinking around that, that it wasn't the name itself that was the problem. It was that because of, as uh, Maria says later in the article, implicit egotism, that people tend to be drawn to things that resemble them. And so if somebody has something that is considered unusual or different than what is considered like everybody else, um, people tend to ostracize that person in different ways socially. And um, continuing um, with the name signaling, there was in 2000 for another study done that had to do with um, uh, from Marianne Bertrand and Sendili Mula Mulanathan. I hope that I pronounced that right. Um, and they did a study on resumes and how um, the names on a resume are also subject to biases from employers. That, for example, if someone has a stereotypically black sounding name or a foreign name, um, that usually it's easier for employers to discriminate against that person versus if the person has a stereotypically white sounding name, employers feel much more um, safer in a sense to hire them um, because of the stereotype that white people may be better workers than other groups of people or that they fit into the culture of the company more than other groups of people. And how um, it's not the names in of itself, but the stereotypes associated with those names that can affect um, how people move through culture and move through a society and whether they're able to get jobs, whether they're able to advance in society, all because their their names are associated with um, certain socioeconomic statuses. And to continue from um, Maria's article, the economics um, economists Stephen Levitt and Roland Fryer looked at trends and names given to Black children in the United States from the 1970s to early aughts. They discovered that names which sounded more distinctly distinctively Black became over time ever more reliable signals of socioeconomic status. That status in turn affected a child's subsequent life outcome, which meant that it was possible to see a correlation between names and outcomes, suggesting a name similar to what was observed in a 1948 Harvard study. But when Levitt and Fryer controlled for the child's background, the name effect disappeared strongly indicating that outcomes were in, weren't influenced by intrinsic qualities of the name itself. As Simon's um, notes, names tell us a lot about who you are. So as the study shows that, again, the name itself isn't what's um, inherently problematic. It's the associations and the stereotypes that we attach to the names that affects how someone moves throughout the world. Same as what Lovey discusses in her essay about because her name is seen as foreign and is seen as hard to um, say, uh, immediately there's a shame attached to her name that, oh, you're different and you don't really fit in with everyone else. And that she changed her name to her nickname just so she didn't have to deal with the constant shaming and constant um, psychological um, psychological effect of people saying that constantly about her name. And this is another article from Beatrice Barba Barbazeni how our name affects our personality and identity, what social psychology says. 
your name has an impact on how people perceive you. The most important anchorage to our self-identity throughout life remains our name. And that's from Gordon Alport. Although choosing a name looks like a test of creativity, parents do not know that choosing a name will influence how others see a person and what the person is most prone to become. Indeed, David Zhu, a professor of management and entrepreneurship at Arizona State University and researcher in the psychology of names, said, because a name is used to identify an individual and communicate with the individual daily, it serves as the very basis of one's self-conception, especially concerning others. However, many factors influence and define the personality, such as genes, socioeconomic environment, personal experiences, culture, and the role taken in life example, family and workplaces. Moreover, at a more fundamental level, names also say something about ethnicity, which may lead to social barriers and stereotypes. Accordingly, research conducted in America during the 9-11 terror attack demonstrated that equally qualified CVs were less likely to attract interviews when attributed to a person with an Arabic sounding name compared with a white sounding name. Even the culture can have a non-negligible effect. Indeed, within a culture, names can be common or rare. Their meaning can carry a positive or negative connotation as fashionable, unfashionable, liked, or disliked. So as you can see, biases around names, it, it's what the name comes to represent to other people and how that can affect how the person can move through society. Consequently, proper names affect how people treat us and how we feel about ourselves. The fact was confirmed by research in 2000, finding that people who disliked their name tended to have poor psychological adjustment due to lack of confidence and self-esteem. But also German research published in 2011 found that having a name that sounds unfashionable is most likely affecting a potential date. Thus, with high probabilities, the person would be rejected compared to others with a more modern and trendy name, leading to the negative consequence of developing low self-esteem and overall less education. Likewise, another study showed a tendency, a lower tendency to receive help from a stranger if the healthy carries a negatively rated name, example, Cindy and Chantal, compared to names rated positively, example, Maria and Sophie. I think that's interesting that even even names that you would think are innocuous or don't really have anything attached to them, if they're seen socially as names that people don't really like, that also can affect how people treat you in society as well. So let's continue uh, reading from Lovey's an essay about the different name changes she goes through in her life. So my first semester in undergrad, I took chemistry 101 because like the cliche immigrant kid I was, kid I, was I thought I wanted to be a doctor. But um, that dream came crashing down when I got a D. We thank God for some failures because I don't even like hospitals, so I would have been no doubt the worst doctor ever. Anywho, I started a web blog that semester. I think it was con called Consider This the Letter I I Never Sent, and it was emo AF. And, and also terrible AF because it was in Comic Sans. Bless my heart. Still, I fell in love with writing and maintained an online journal throughout my undergrad years. I was lovette to my friends still, but some started calling me lovey for short. When I graduated, I deleted that blog where I talk about the exams I was failing and roommate beefs, and I started a new one, awesomely lovey. I decided to talk about the world as I saw it. I talked about race, feminism, shenanigans, and anything else I felt like. I wrote with a voice that was without pretense because I didn't think of it as anything but a hobby. I was working as a marketing coordinator for a nonprofit and liked it, but I would get home and write on my blog regularly. It was like a part-time job that didn't pay me. Try as I might to, to insist that it was just a cute hobby that I had, 
my blog grew organically and started winning awards. More people started to know who Lovey was than who Lovette was, and people started to call me a writer, me. She of no couth who was only writing her opinions on a little website, me, a writer. Isn't that what you call Toni Morrison and Terry McMillan? Those are writers. Yeah, so ain't no way I can be using the same title as them. That was imposter syndrome speaking, of course, that hater ass be. I had convinced myself that my version of writing, therefore, my gift was not extraordinary. When I got laid off from my job in April 2010, I should have taken that as my cue to pay attention to the things I was doing, but I still didn't give it credence. I looked for other jobs to no avail and would do freelance consulting to make money to buy shoes because priorities. There were times when I wanted to quit my blog because I figured that I should probably put more energy into job hunting than this little website. But every time I, I'd want to quit, I'd get some press or amazing note from someone who, who'd read my work saying what an impact it had on them. In 2012, I got credentialed to do press coverage at the Academy Awards because of my blog. I got both red carpet and backstage access. I was in the room. I was eating all the Wolfgang Puck's catered shrimp back there instead of, you know, covering it when it finally made sense to me. I'm a writer. My words got me here. I was standing next to journalists from CNN, the BBC, the New York Times. I was out of excuses not to declare it. I'm a writer. Soon after I was being interviewed by a journalist doing a feature on me and the not so little blog that could, and they asked, how should we credit you for this? Lovette Ajayi or Awesomely Lovey? I answered Lovey Ajayi before I could even think too hard about it. Just Lovey Ajayi is fine. I had all of a sudden dropped Lovette and it didn't jar me at all. Why? Because I knew Lovey needed to move forward and Lovette had served me well. It was time. The woman who can say I'm a writer with an exclamation point, not a question mark. The woman who was scared of what it all meant was excited to see about it anyway. The woman who knew her purpose was to move people with her words. She was here and ready to stand in it. That is how Lovey Ajayi came to be. I decided to keep doing that thing that scared me because on the other side of it would always be victory. I went all in on my purpose driven life to use my words to make people laugh, think critically and leave this world better than they found it. With the mission in mind, I wrote my book, I'm J Judging You, The Do Better Manual in 2015 and it was published in 2016. That book hit the New York Times bestseller list in the first week it came out, changed my life. Because of it, I was able to fulfill my lifelong dream of, of retiring my mom. I called her a month after my book dropped and told her she never had to work again because I could officially handle her bills and mine. My life had changed so much since, and my career has grown. My personal life has also shifted. I met a dude, started dating him, got proposed to, said yes, and got married to him. So on the day in September 2019 when I said, let's do this life thing together in my wedding vows, it signaled a shift in priorities. I see myself go from the work, work, work woman to the woman who is now trying to find ways to focus more on herself. Family is now first before anything. I felt compelled to reflect that my name, that in my name, which for a recovering commitment foe and a fiercely independent goat is a big deal. I even put it in my first book that my, that my taking my future husband's name was not a given because what if his last name was something like Fokker? Thankfully, I found Mia Jones. But was I going to take that name publicly and professionally? I wasn't sure. I was 34 when I got married with a career that spanned 16 years. I had a brand, y'all, a brand. Was I going to change that? Well, my brand is of something, of someone who is authentic, and the real me knew I wanted to do it, but I was scared. What was I scared of? Same thing I was afraid of when I didn't call myself a writer. The title of wife felt so big, and although I was one, I wasn't sure I could live up to it. Hell yeah, I was scared. So I did that thing I did with Lovett. I double dutch between using Jones on professional things and leaving it off. For my speaking engagements or press mentions in the months following my wedding, there was no consistency. 
Sometimes I told people to use Lovey Ajayi. Other times I said Lovey Ajayi Jones. I got It got confusing to me in a way that was familiar and I knew I had to make the decision. One day my literary agent, Christine, called and asked, what name should we put on your book cover regarding my second book, Professional Troublemaker, The Fear Fighter Manual? I told her I'd call back. Then I called two of my friends and asked them what they thought. They didn't give me the answer I wanted, which was firm direction. They simply said, well, what feels right for you, for your book? Me? I don't know. That's why I'm calling you. Tell me. Nope. They did no such thing. Wow. So I really had to figure this out on my own, huh? Adulting is a scam. I called Christine, told her to show me two versions of the cover, one that said Lovey Ajay and one that said Lovey Ajay Jones. So she did. And the only one that felt right was that said, the one that said Lovey Ajay Jones. Why? Because the other one felt incomplete as if it was missing something. It was missing the new version of me I, that I needed to own fully, not halfway. I couldn't half-ass this, even though it was scary. I called Christine and said Lovey Ajay Jones. I went all, on all my websites and changed my display name. I didn't do it to prove anything to anyone, not even myself. I did it because everything... I did because everything in me said do it. It was scary and daunting and loud proclamation of who I was and one of who I wa now was and one of the things I prioritized, the sacred space of my marital home. It wasn't that I'd be less married if I decided to go by Lovey Ajay. The decision of what name we choose once married does not invalidate our commitment. But for me, like in the past, I knew that to be all in for this new season of my life, this was important for me to do. I couldn't drop Ajayi though. Across the years, as my name has shifted, that has remained steady, that it anchored me. I needed it to remain, to continue to tie me to my culture and lineage publicly, even as I created my own traditions. I also think about a little nine-year-old girl somewhere who's in a new land whose name is also heavy on people's tongues. I want her to have me to look to as an example, an affirmation that her roots are worth keeping strong. I hope she hears my Ajayi spoken and knows her diasporic epithet is worth celebrating, not hiding. Besides Lovey Jones, sounds very much like I'm trying to be nostalgic about a 19, 19th um, romantic movie fave, Love Jones. Although it was the reason we made our wedding hashtag hashtag love jones best wedding hashtag of all time in my natural naturally honest opinion i've settled into the woman i am and into this marriage thing my three-prong name feels like a pair of shoes that are slightly too big because i still have much growing to do and expansion can be daunting but often it is necessary i don't plan on making another name change mr J Mr. Jones is stuck with me forever and he is very welcome. Ifeo Lua Ajayi made way for Lovett Ajayi to protect herself in a new land. Lovett made way for Lovey to claim her purpose. Lovey, Lovey Ajayi Jones has taken all the lessons she learned from all of them and is the best version of herself she's ever been, wiser than ever and more grown than ever. My names, all four of them, have been teachers for me. And I'm thankful for each of those people I was because they led to who I am today. And I'm thankful to my parents for naming me so well. The path of love they let for me in my name has been a tool of resilience through any fear and anchor through chaos. The names we have tell stories and mine speak for the journey of someone who has transformed so many times in her life, taking ownership of who she is in the world and creating sacred spaces for herself. My names have been my affirmation, and I am grateful. So with um, Lovey's essay, you can see how um, her changing her name throughout her life reflected the various changes she went through in her own personal life and um, how we tend to, and this is the next part I'm going to talk about is name changing is actually normal for us. We we do it often, but sometimes we demonize certain people for doing it. 
And again, back to the idea of name signaling, how we attach certain stereotypes and associations with um, certain people um, based on their names. So in thinking about um, name changing, I wanted to bring up trans people and um, how name changing for trans people is an important part of them accepting who they are and um, for their own gender affirmation. And this is Call Me By My Name, Name Changes Positively Affect Trans People by John Loepke, uh, Dr. Odd Hennon, PhD, who's a co-director of the Child Cognitive Behavioral Behavioral Therapy Program at Massachusetts General Hospital for Children. She confirms that names are a core part of someone looking to understand their shifting relationships with gender. Names are critical to our identities and, they often, and they're often the first thing that people see on paper. And so being able to change your name to something that reflects your identity is essential. And recent research in SSM population health points to the fact that making legal changes to name and gender markers is linked to lower rates of mental health effects, including depression and anxiety. And this was um, from 13 stories of folks who had a legal name change um, from Teen Vogue. Um, and that included uh, non-binary people and trans people in general. And at the beginning, they said, there are different reasons why people decide to change their name. For some, a name change is related to marriage, like Lovey, who we just read. For others, a name change is about protecting themselves from a violent past, or in Lovey's case, um, protecting her from the shame and the fear of being a new immigrant in a, a new land. And for the transgender community, a name change often signifies gender affirmation, among other things. And this other study from the University of Texas also, um, also says how using a chosen name reduces the odds of depression and suicide in transgender uh, youths as well. Researchers interviewed transgender youth ages 15 to 21 and asked whether young people could use their chosen name at school, home, work, and with friends. Compared with peers who could not use their chosen name in any context, young people who could use their name in all four areas experienced 71% fewer symptoms of severe depression, a 34% decrease in reported thoughts of suicide, and a 65% decrease in suicidal attempts. Earlier research by Russell found that transgender youths report having suicidal thoughts at nearly twice the rate of their peers, with about one out of three transgender youths reporting considering suicide. In the new study, having even one context in which chosen name could be used was associated with a 29% decrease in suicidal thoughts. The researchers controlled for personal characteristics and social support. So here you can see the, the having the ability to use your chosen name allows you to feel a sense of empowerment and agency in your own life. And when a trans person can't use their own chosen name, they feel a sense of helplessness and hopelessness in their life. And this is another article from Why Everything You Thought About Slave Names Could Be Wrong by Moya Loithian McLean. And I wanted to bring this up because oftentimes when we think of name changes, we often think of it in reference to trans people, but um, we can also connect this to the history of people who um, are the descendants of enslaved black people, who um, uh, those who were enslaved uh, black people often had their traditional cultural names stripped from them and then had the names of the people who were enslaving them um, be given to them. So that kind of conflicting identity of not having um, the names that your family 
originally had from Africa and now having the the names of your enslaver. And so with some people, they've decided to change their their names to take on traditionally African names. So they feel more connected to that kind of lost heritage and legacy. While for some other people, they decided still to keep their names that even though it comes from an enslaving family, it still allows them to connect, have a record of family who are in America that they can still find. And also it's it still reflects who they are within the context of American history and having that record of history there that they can still feel like they're tied to. And finally, I wanna bring up um, this article from Names and Identity, the Native American Naming Tradition by Elizabeth Pearson Wagaman, PhD, and how Native American naming traditions can enrich your sense of self. And um, I bring this one up because in um, this specific Native American culture, um, Mo Mohegans, uh, in their naming tradition, names are always changing. So children receive names that are descriptive. They may be given new names at adolescence. And again, as they go through life, according to what their life experiences and accomplishments are, um, society bestows, bestows them a new name. A new name is earned. W.S. Brooke explains, some people are like lakes. They change very little as they age. Some people are like rivers. When you trace the Mississippi or any other river at its source, it can be very small. Later on, it can become wide and strong. When it meets the ocean, it spreads out. In other words, names should change as the individuals change. And that brings us back to what I was saying about the importance of naming traditions and naming ceremonies, because um, when we look at, um, for example, trans people, we might think, oh, it's unusual that they want to change their names. Why is, it, why is that important? When in many cultures, that's actually a normal thing. That changing our names reflects who we are, that we're constantly in flux and are changing beings and life experiences change who we are. And so our names should reflect that. And it's okay to respect those name changes because that's normal. And we shouldn't treat trans people as being anything other than also human and that that is part of human culture in general. We love to name things. We love to change the names of things when it, it shows a new facet of who what it is to us. It's normal. So in thinking about all of that, and this is another um, article about the effects of changing your name as well. And that um, changing your name also reveals uh, something about ourselves as well. So this person um, named Regan, um, when they changed their name, it allowed them to hear who really cared about them and who didn't really care about them based off of how their name sounded when it, it was called from that other person. So even changing our name changes the perception of ourselves as well. So in thinking about that, I want to leave us a few minutes for the last prompt, name changes. Think of, thinking about where you are currently in your life, what is a possible new name you would choose for yourself and why? And I will give you a few minutes to do that and then we'll close out with the resources.
Okay, so I hope you were able to choose a name for yourself that is affirming for you. And so we're going to end with resources. Um, I wanted to mention uh, an important essay from Ralph Ellison um, called Hidden Name and Complex Fate. And I really enjoy this um, essay because he talks about how he was named after another writer, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and how because he was named after Ralph Waldo Emerson, he constantly felt haunted by that name and that person and how having basically the same name, because his name is Ralph Waldo Ellison, um, how moving throughout his life as a writer himself, he was constantly influenced by Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson and how other people viewed him and saw him because of his name connection to another writer. And then I also wanted to bring up this essay called African Names and Naming Practices, The Impact Slavery and European Domination Had on the African Psyche, Identity and Protest by Lacelli A. Fitzpatrick, because I wanted to bring up how naming practices changed and evolved from West Africa to the Americas and how slavery impacted naming for um, descendants of enslaved Africans like myself. And then the last two resources, 28 Brilliant Books About Names and Why They Matter by Mihari Sim and 25 Books to Teach Kids About the Importance of Names by Jean Croteau are two lists that give various children books to um, help teachers and parents discuss names um, with your own kids as well. So that is it for today. And thank you for joining me. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to put them in the chat. Thank you, Cherise. Um, that was such a great um, workshop today. Um, if I could, I'd like to uh, share my name, my full name. Mm -hmm. um, it's the beloved who carries the weight of the anointed one from the birch forest. Ooh. I thought that was, yeah, I thought that was very poetic. <laughs> I liked it a lot. <laughs> nice. That is gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, you spoke a lot about how um, empowering our names can be and how empowering um, changing our names can be. Um, mm -hmm. But one thing that really resonated with me and and something that I have been um, thinking about was towards the end, you were saying, um, you quoted someone about how the way that they say your name or the name that they use for you, you mm -hmm. can kind of get an idea or, or kind of sense of how they feel about you. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I have struggled with my entire life. So, you know, my name is Christopher. And I prefer to be called Christopher, mm -hmm. um, but some people, you know, even knowing that I prefer to be called Christopher, call me Chris, right? Mm -hmm. And and whether it's um, pernicious or not, whenever someone doesn't call me by the name that I prefer, that I've let them know, it kind of hints in the back of my mind of like, well, I don't care about that, right? Mm -hmm. And so can you, you know, can you talk about how... Um, how sometimes even the like outside people and outside narratives mm -hmm. can influence how we understand our own names. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, that's the thing about names is that we, um, when we're born, we technically don't choose our names. <laughs> and that like throughout life, you kind of have to kind of resolve how you feel about your name and resolve how other people may feel about you through calling your name. And that kind of complex identity of like how we think about ourselves, but also how other people perceive us. Like even when we think of like slurs, right? Mm -hmm. Slurs are a kind of naming as well. And that what people call you is often a reflection of them as well. So 
I mentioned earlier about names and associations mm -hmm. and stereotypes that like we may perceive ourselves in a certain way. And like you said, you like to be called Christopher because that's what you're attached to, that that's what's affirming for you. Mm -hmm. But other people might be like, well, what's the big deal? Chris is a nickname for you anyway, but it's like, you're not attached to that. That doesn't mean as much for you versus calling yourself Christopher, mm -hmm. right? So like needing people to understand that like, it's not about them, it's about you and how you feel f about yourself. And that you being called what you like to be called is other people showing you, I care enough to call you that because that's what you like. Mm -hmm. and. Yeah. And also, like, in understanding that, that people will do the same for you as well. It's respecting each other's agency, basically. Yeah, and, and accepting your own agency and, okay. and setting those boundaries. Yeah. Um, so I want to say thank you so much, Cherise. Thank you, um, everyone who joined us today. Um, we hope to see you next time, and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye, Bye. everyone.